Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. A very warm welcome to the second day of our conference, Next Generation, Reflections and Future Perspectives on Higher Education in the Former Soviet Union. I'm Emma Sabzalieva, Senior Policy Analyst at UNESCO ESALC, and delighted to be able to open today's session uh, with just a few quick remarks before I hand over to the moderator of today's panel, who will in turn introduce our really excellent lineup of speakers. Yesterday, uh, we had a really engaging discussion around institutional transformations in higher education, thinking about higher education at systems level and the way that that has changed, perhaps not so much changed or continues to transform across the former Soviet space. With speakers from Russia, Belarus and Kazakhstan, we were nevertheless able through the speakers and through the conversations that we had with participants to traverse our way across the former Soviet space. And today I'm thrilled that we'll be able to bring in even more different perspectives as we explore the topic of our roundtable, which is the social responsibilities of higher education. Um, as ever, we encourage you, if you're participating, to post your chats um, in the uh, post your questions and comments in the chat. Uh, we will have dedicated time at the end of the sort of uh, facilitated conversation to take up as many of those questions as we can. Um, and even if we can't, it's a really excellent way to kind of spark your thinking um, and to engage in reflection on this really important series of topics. So with that in mind, I'm going to um, shortly hand over to Yevgeny Terentiev, who's the director of the Institute of Education at the National Research University Higher School of Economics, Moscow, or HSC University. And we're thrilled to be partnering with HSC University in the organization of this conference. Um, Yevgeny is also a graduate of the same university in the Department of so Sociology and received his PhD in 2016. His main research interests include student experience at higher education institutions, reforms of doctoral education in Russia and worldwide, and the transformation of the academic profession. Yevgeny, thank you very much for moderating today's panel. I'm very pl pleased to hand over to you. Thank you. Yes, Emma, thank you so much for this brief introduction and colleagues, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Uh, first of all, I would like to say many thanks to the organizers of this really brilliant conference. It's a great honor for me to be moderator of uh, for today's roundtable, participate in other discussions during this uh, conference because it covers really important and uh, poor discussed, I think, both academically and professionally topic related to the actual transformation and future perspectives of higher education in post-Soviet countries. So at the same time, this topic is uh, really important and timely because being a largely a large part of global educational landscape, national systems of higher education in post-Soviet uh, countries experience significant and different transformations during the last uh, 30 years. So it's really important to be reflexive about this transformation and discuss it to share our experience, our visions about this transformation and so forth. So we could state, for instance, uh, the following questions. So what are the different trajectories of countries uh, during this uh, post-Soviet period? Uh, why different countries chose different trajectories? How they evaluate the experience? So it's really important that we share different experience from different countries uh, in this conference. So these are only several questions which could be asked in our discussions, but today in our small only 75 uh, minutes uh, round table, we will focus more precisely on one very important aspect, the social responsibility of higher education, which played extremely important role as a foundation or let me say uh, keystone of higher education and Soviet Union. So we are going to uh, ask such questions and receive some responses to them, uh, such as uh, what are the historical roots uh, of social responsibility of higher education institutions in Soviet Union, uh, how the views on the social role of higher education has evolved during the last 40 years, and how universities in more and post-Soviet countries contribute to social development. So there are, I think, uh, several questions which will form uh, our discussion, which we are going to start right now. Uh, I do not want to steal time from our main speakers, so I will um, 
starts on this brief introduction but before we start uh, i would like to announce uh, that we will have the immersive format of our discussion so it's really important that not only main speakers um, will participate uh, in our discussion but all other participants of our round table uh, However, the roundtable will consist of two main parts. The first will be a structured roundtable with discussion between the moderator and main speakers. Uh, um, and then we will have a chance to ask questions from the auditorium. So it will be great if we will collect this question in the written form in the chat of this session. Uh, and then um, after the main uh, Q&A, uh, uh, structured part of our discussion, we will have a chance to uh, ask these questions. So, um, so let's start is, um, our just Indeed, let's bring in the uh, panelists for today, please, from our side. I'm not seeing them on the screen at the moment. Um, great, great. Thank you so much uh, for fixing and colleagues. So I will introduce uh, main speakers one by one, then while I will uh, ask uh, the questions to them, and we will start from Maya Cheng Seliani. Uh, she is a associate, associate professor of comparative and international education and at the University of Oxford, uh, UK. And she researches societal, institutional, and policy forces that shape tertiary education and the potential of tertiary education and the research for transforming societies. And also, she serves on the executive committee on the Education and Development Forum. And she's an associate editor of International Journal of Educational Research. This is really brief uh, introduction. My welcome. Uh, thank you so much for joining this. Uh, I hope a fruitful and interesting roundtable will be to you uh, and will be the following. How have the social responsibilities of higher education been framed in former Soviet countries? I know that you are a very specialist in the historical roots of the Soviet model and that is from in its transformation in post-Soviet countries, so please. Thank you very much for your introduction. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all participants. Um, I will try to address this very big question um, as briefly as possible. So university, when we think about universities, universities are unique spaces where we seek truths about ourselves, about the world around us. They are spaces of learning and creativity, critical argumentation, self-formation, places where we develop our individual and collective agency, and where we socialize into our professions and occupations. Universities are spaces where knowledge is born, shaped, questioned, problematized, and sometimes discarded or recreated. Many of you in the audience, and I'm really pleased to see so many people joining in, would agree that this view that I just described differs considerably from the Soviet view of university, serving the needs of the economy, and the communist society with a strict alignment between the supply and the demand for labor. The question of social responsibilities of higher education becomes particularly pertinent in our societies, I think, nowadays, when issues of higher education funding, graduate employment, and the quality of higher education are discussed. I have observed that the degree of institutional autonomy and academic freedom can shape in our societies the ways in which students, academics, industry, government, and the wider society see the responsibilities of universities. The degree of institutional autonomy and academic freedom can also shape the ways in which universities and academics see their own contributions to the wider society. At the same time, the ways in which university responsibilities are defined within specific national and institutional contexts can impact the autonomy of universities and the freedom enjoyed by academics to more effectively serve their societies. Now think about this, framing of university responsibilities may range from a very conservative, very essentialist view of university as an institution that transmits knowledge to an extremely liberal, 
anti-essentialist, as I call it, view of university offering an environment for individual self-formation, blue skies research, and all other things that I mentioned at the start. The essentialist framing of university contributions to societal development involves a great emphasis on the university's role in developing human capital, preparing employable graduates, and contributing to the modernization of societies. In contrast, what I call the anti-essentialist framing, framing that does not focus on one attribute of universities as essential is about supporting individuals and societies to realize their human rights, capabilities to pursue freedoms that they value. Those things that they value may be very different for different individuals and different universities and different societies. In some cases, this may include power of higher education for liberating individuals and liberating societies. While essentialist framing of purpose is focused on employability, modernization is very rigid, the anti-essentialist framing is very fluid, leaving a lot of freedom for agents of development, I mean individuals and institutions decide about their ways of contributing to society. Now, together with Iqbal John Karaboev, who, who is on the panel here, as well as our colleague Dilbert Granova, we did an interesting study investigating the ways in which academics in Georgia and Kazakhstan see the societal contributions of universities. So what we found out was quite interesting because we asked academics about their own views of what societal responsibilities of universities are, as well as what they thought were the views of students with who they worked, as well as their administrators. So what we discovered was that many of the academics in our survey thought that universities' main responsibility was to provide time and space for individuals to learn new things and to discover who an individual is and what they want to become. Very fluid version of university responsibilities. In contrast, they thought that their views, the views of their students and their administrators were much more focused on instrumental purposes of university related to employability and modernization. Thus, we saw a little bit of a gap between academics' views and the views of their students and institutions as academics saw that. I'm sure the listeners in the audience have their own strongly held views on the societal responsibilities of HE, irrespective of our views, whether our views lean towards a more rigid ideas, more instrumental ideas focused on employability and modernization, or whether they lean more towards uh, a fluid understanding focused on freedoms, focused on agency, and the right of individuals and institutions to define their own purposes and their own ways of contributing society, irrespective of where we lean, which side we lean towards, there remains a lot to be done about supporting the development of free thinking, autonomous individuals within our universities and universities as autonomous and free spaces in post-Soviet countries. One of the fundamental characteristics of the Soviet higher education, not encouraging critical analysis, critical discourses and critical meaning making has not seen as much change in these countries as some of us wish to see. And however we frame societal responsibilities of higher education, universities will not be in a strong position to fulfill those purposes effectively without sufficient autonomy. Thank you. Maya, well, thank you so much for this comprehensive and really uh, discussable uh, answer to this question uh, theoretically find it i think it's really great starting point uh, for our thorough discussion and i would like to introduce the second speaker for our today round table it will be iqbal john koraboyev uh, he is a associate professor of international relations at the higher school of economics of uh, narikbayev university in Sultan, kazakhstan 
and Associate Research Fellow of the United Nations University Institute on Comparative Regional Integration Studies, Belgium. He is also a member of International Experts Council of El Yurt Umidi Foundation, created to promote human capital development under the Agency for Public Service Development of uh, Uzbekistan. His research interests span across comparative regionalism studies, international relations, and international law with a particular focus on Eurasia and Central Asia. So, Ibaljan, thank you so much uh, for joining our uh, panel session. And my question to you will be the following. How do universities ensure their service to society through research outputs while integrating in global higher education and research? Please. Uh, yeah, Th thank you very much, Evgeny, and thank to organizers for such an interesting and very important, in fact, uh, discussion and self-reflection on post-Soviet uh, yeah, developments in the field of uh, higher education. Uh, so uh, coming to your uh, question, uh, Evgeny, about uh, the how should universities approach their service to society through research outputs yeah, while also integrating in global higher education and uh, research. Uh, what uh, Professor Chang Siliane uh, the, the initiated yet yeah, the, the how the universities in post-Soviet space yes we can use this uh, the term post-Soviet space uh, are in fact torn between uh, two different uh, paradigms uh, of the role of universities with respect. Uh, their mission, yes, uh, towards society and towards uh, the state, uh, this more traditional Soviet uh, heritage uh, understanding of the university as, uh, you know, one of many actors uh, fulfilling, continuing to serve the goals of the state, yeah, uh, in terms of instrumentalist approach. And then the second approach is more modern if we can say uh, that a liberal approach of uh, serving as a platform for uh, young people but also for the lecturers yes to develop themselves into self-conscious uh, citizens yes contributing to the development of society not only with respect to you know the state uh, defined uh, frameworks but also you know with respect to society to to, to, to the market yeah so uh, if we follow uh, this, uh, you know, we can say bifurcation yeah, or this kind of uh, transition. Yes. So uh, the, of course, the universities uh, they uh, they are in fact in terms of uh, research outputs. Yes. Uh, for example, when you say this transition paradigm. Yes. Uh, so during these thirty years. Uh, this transition is supported, yes, yes, it comes from the, the domestic actors, yes, but it, it is also institutionally supported by external uh, donors, yes, international development uh, institutions, yeah, or uh, what we call a group of uh, developed countries, yes, who are in different way like uh, ODA and uh, other kind of uh, channeling uh, the so here the universities were seen as also actors of transition yes why because uh, they would be uh, they would be prepare they would be preparing new generations of professionals but with a, a new set of skills yeah compared to uh, soviet uh, legacy a new set of uh, knowledge, yeah, new set of uh, critical uh, thinking. Uh, so from here, that's why the university lecturers, yeah, in many of our countries, they were also uh, considered as experts, yes, contributing uh, to uh, produce, for example, uh, the reports, yeah, uh, the national level and regional level. Uh, reports, yes, which include data collection, data analysis, but also the knowledge uh, dissemination, yes, but this new kind of knowledge, new kind of uh, thinking dissemination uh, across the uh, across the region, yes. So 
Uh, this is one way of the universities, yes, contributing uh, to uh, integration of our region to global higher education and uh, research uh, area, yeah? Like the professors, lecturers, role also as experts, yes, in creating and disseminating knowledge. And then the, uh, the second, which is uh, more uh, traditional, yeah, and which is in, in fact uh, implemented, but in uh, different ways, sometimes in un unexpected uh, forms is uh, this uh, classic uh, contribution of uh, universities uh, to the creation of uh, academic and uh, knowledge, yes, scientific knowledge, theories, concepts, yes, and critical uh, analysis, critical reflections of the societal uh, development, uh, which in contemporary uh, academia, yeah, uh, takes uh, the form of uh, scientific articles, yes, or uh, research articles in uh, in a, in uh, like priorly, but also then edited books, yes, uh, book chapters, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But in, in the post-Soviet uh, space, yes, this uh, traditional, uh, the scientific knowledge uh, creation, yeah, it, uh, it is happening uh, in such a way uh, that uh, during this, you know, transition, protract, protracted transition, we can say that where uh, the two of these uh, cultures, yes, what we call yeah, traditional old culture of doing science, yes, publishing science, yeah, or collaborating or not collaborating, and then the modern ways of uh, uh, this uh, research uh, generation, research output generation. These two cultures they uh, coexist, yeah, and sometimes they also clash, yeah. Why? Because we have, for example, different uh, expectations from a, from a university or from researchers in terms of producing international scientific articles in English language, even if, uh, you know, most of the post-Soviet countries, researchers, the majority, uh, invisible majority, they are, you know, they are more comfortable or they are trained to work in their own national languages, but also in, uh, in Russian languages. So these two cultures, they are also making an impact that we have some, yeah, we have some very good developments, uh, uh, like, uh, for example, the, the, in the recent works of Maya uh, about this big picture of post-Soviet publication landscape, yeah, uh, where we have collaboration, you know, uh, and globalization of, uh, you know, the knowledge creation, but we also have now emerging uh, and kind of becoming self perpetuating problem of predatory publications yeah uh, and which is kind of you know it creates an illusion that we are creating a lot of knowledge yeah and so as such universities are in fact contributing to the development of society to the advancement of the goals of innovation development as set out by governments but also by uh, by the society yeah but it's an illusion yeah in, in in reality it's undermining uh, kind of and it is kind of contributing to this protection of this you know the unfulfillment or incomplete uh, transition of things and so here for example universities could serve their uh, the uh, service to the society yeah by uh, kind of you know realizing this kind of uh, you know an in-depth uh, self-reflection but not only universities, but together with national, you know, the the administration that the, the regulatory, you know, uh, actors which are responsible for, you know, regulating all this research output, in order to, you know, to uh, uh, scrutinize uh, the the deeper reasons, yes, uh, for this kind of predatory, you know, the the phenomenon. Yeah, we we have for now like naming shaming strategies like very active in russia dissonant community etc yeah but so far these are horizontal in order for the universe to better integrate the global research uh, and education uh, platforms so that they could improve their standing they could uh, improve their contributions to the uh, to the service i think there should be kind of both 
horizontal, vertical, and mixed, you know, dialogue and analysis and you know self reflection on uh, uh, on this uh, research output, yes, or research uh, practices and research output. Thank you. Thank you so much for this very reflexive uh, response to my question uh, and covering some issues related to the development of uh, this academic manufacture in post-Soviet countries. And now we will continue discussion of the development of uh, hybrid in uh, post-Soviet countries in international context. And I would like to introduce Susanna Karahanyan, uh, she is a uh, higher education policy and regulation director at the Abu Dhabi Department of Education and Knowledge, uh, United Arab Emirates. She is an immediate past president of the International Network of Quality Assurance Agencies in Higher Education. And Dr. Karhanyan's expertise revolves around tertiary education in general and policy making, governance, and quality assurance in particular. She has worked with around 45 governments on capacity building and strong views of government structures, legal and policy frameworks, and uh, quality assurance systems. So, uh, Susanna, my next question is uh, to you. Thank you. For joining uh, our panel session, and the question is the following: In which ways, if any, uh, has higher education in the former Soviet space changed in response to the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals? Well, thank you very much, Evgeny, and thank you very much, everybody, for this very um, nice discussion that is unfolding. Very useful and much long view. This is really very important, and uh, I hope that this will find its continuation in follow-up steps. Um, in terms of SDGs and um, the changes that have taken place due to the countries committing to SDGs uh, in post-Soviet area, I would like to mention that, well, it, it merits to highlight that the changes have been taking take, taking place like at three different levels, like policy level should be discussed separately, then system level, how the systems have changed, and individually at the institutional level. Well, at the policy level, it seems all um, nicely done. The government's committed to it and did the alignment between the policies and the, the currently adopted policies of the country with the SDGs, and they found that there is predominantly maybe 80% and above alignment across, on average, across all the former Soviet countries, policies, uh, policy level uh, with the SDGs. When we move on to the system level, we would feel like, well, the developments there are really uh, evolving in a um, uh, sporadic way and they're not consistently and coherently designed at system level. And uh, in majority of the cases, you would find that um, systems are struggling to come up to introduce the policies with, um, uh, you know, equity, um, inclusion, and quality of education. And uh, well, I mean, although the SDG goal number four is uh, on equality education, basically the 17 SDG goals are linked to this goal. So this is the core, basically, the education and especially the um, uh, tertiary education when we prepare um, the society to contribute to um, uh, to the society, uh, I mean, to the more uh, to economic goals. Well, at system level, I would say that there is very intangible improvement across all the uh, Soviet countries. But when we move on to the institutional level, you would uh, see that individual institutions are taking steps forward, are taking initiatives. And um, if you go ahead and try to understand how are the individual institutions performing, you would find that it's only select institutions in each of the former Soviet countries that is actually providing a transparent information, sharing the transparent information on their performance against the SDGs. Um, when we delve deeper into the performance of the institutions and go to the special to the change agents, like to the implementers of um, the uh, committed uh, reforms, you would see it even um, uh, a very mix, uh, a very diverse, uh, you know, level of approaches that are coming from different individuals. We have um, uh, a group of um, uh, individuals who are um, 
you know, with the strong values uh, from the Soviet Union and the legacy and preserving the legacy of the Soviet Union in terms of conservative approach to more, more conservative uh, and resistant to the approach uh, to the changes that could happen at any level. Uh, there is another category of um, uh, engagement coming from higher education institutions who had first-hand exposure to um, uh, diverse systems globally, and they are bringing in different values in place. So we would see the clashes of different values coming into the at the institutional level. And of course, there are uh, a lot of benefits and a, a lot of pros and cons in different, you know, bringing in diverse values. But what is missing out there is how to put all of these um uh, best um ideas best practices into a coherent framework to contribute at all the three levels well we we feel that um well, when you look at the policy level from all uh different governments policy documentation seems to be all well, i mean more or less in place but what happens at the implementation level is something that is uh, really uh, of a major concern, and especially given the fact, and we, we should highlight that, uh, the fact of corruption being at all levels, which is impeding this development forward, development towards more um, independent and transparent and, uh, you know, uh, act, uh, uh, functioning of the higher education institutions. So, um, well, I would say that, well, Although we all talk about, and yesterday we also covered the topics of ranking, but just to touch on this, out of 15 former Soviet countries, only eight are currently on time star education uh, in terms of the ranking of against the SDGs. Uh, and um, uh, they are predominantly, they are uh, ranking very low in terms of the achievement of the in, in SDGs against the SDGs. And um, it's only with um, some of the leading institutions being in top uh, 200. So um, very, very few of them. So what, well, we all know and question and we don't trust like, you know, ranking and methodology is really questionable. We all know about it, but it's one of the indicators that uh, we, we should be just at least uh, looking at uh, among all other indicators that are available all out there. In terms of the quality education, and we conducted a study, a global study, which covers all seven, uh, seven regions in the globe. And specifically, um, uh, we concentrated on Eastern Europe when we were covering the quality of education and looking at the quality assurance mechanisms on how to promote um, institutional performance. And then um, uh, basically we would say that both the institutions and the quality assurance uh, bodies um, the information they provided is like, yes, um, we are undergoing a lot of changes, but the tangible impact, expected impact is yet to, um, uh, to come. I mean, there is no tangible um, impact leading to effective performance of the institutions yet. So unfortunately, well, but, but we also have to acknowledge the context we are working in, because unlike other systems globally, unlike other regions globally, former Soviet countries are, under, are undergoing not only the transformation in terms of educational reforms or adjusting to you know, international trends and integrating into the uh, international uh, global arena. Um, um, we are also undergoing a lot of economic, the, the whole economy, the, so, the whole ideology of the Soviet Union is being in transformation here and changing ideologies are much more difficult than changing anything else. So the mindset of the uh, change agents is still, um, uh, it, it needs more of capacity uh, development, capacity building, more exposure, more understanding and sharing the values of why. Because majority of the population and all higher education institutions, in one of my studies, when, when I conducted the implementation of Bologna in post-Soviet context, uh, the higher education um, institutions and the the change agent the, the faculty members and the administrators and the leaders uh, it seemed like they didn't share the same values of why this is really important for us why something should come and substitute whatever is already already in the place so being explicit being clear 
in terms of the values. This is also something that needs to be done. And um, more work, more um, first-hand exposure to the best practices. I think that this is something, uh, one of the ways forward. But I will stop here because there are so many other questions. And I know that I had only five minutes to talk. But um, when you talk at different levels of SDGs, yes, uh, there is a major discrepancy between the policy level. At the system level, we would see something like a Frankenstein monster effect because nothing coherent and everything is just patches putting the patches over here and there without coming a systemic and coherent approach to to, to changes and at the institutional level we would see just individual institutions trying their best to bring in uh, their contribution to the societal development i'll stop here and i will cover in, in the follow-up questions thank you thank you so much Susanna, for this very problematizing uh, uh, context which you introduced to us. It's really important. I think that we will have a chance to come back to develop some ideas further in our discussion. And now I'm glad to introduce the fourth participant of our discussion, uh, Bahram Mirkasimov. Uh, he's Rector of Westminster International University in Tashkent, Uzbekistan, and a Global Labor Organization Fellow. Previously, he was Deputy Director for Research and Innovation and Principal Lecturer at uh, the IUT. Uh, he's Managing Editor of the New International Previewed Open Access Journal, Silk Road, uh, a journal of Eurasian development. So, Bahram, uh, thank you so much uh, for joining our uh, panel discussion. And my question to you is the following. The phrase uh, world education space is widely used in Russian to describe an aspiration for higher education. To what extent do you see higher education in the former Soviet uh, space now being part of this global society? And how do you think this might change in the next 30 years? Please. Uh, Eugenie, thank you very much uh, for inviting and uh, great to be on this forum with the panelists and everyone. Um, I'll reframe your question a bit, so I'm not going to answer for the whole former Soviet Union countries, but I will speak about the uh, case of Uzbekistan. So for those uh, who uh, do not know <clears throat> what's happening in Uzbekistan, uh, it's a very exciting time to be here, especially if you're working in higher education, uh, because it's sort of a huge experimental ground uh, for many, many big, bold political reforms in the higher education area in the last five years. And I will give you concrete examples. For example, uh, five years ago, you could not think of that uh, the number of universities and higher education institutions will double. Uh, that's revolutionary. So. Um, uh, if, if you say we had close to 70 or about 70 university, now the number is 159. So we have 159 higher education institutions operating in Uzbekistan. So five years ago, if you tell me that we will open a private university or non-governmental university and more branches of international universities in Uzbekistan, uh, no one would believe you. So now we have close to 50. Uh, universities that are non-governmental or uh, branches of different international universities or private universities. So the numbers are growing. So five years ago, if you could tell me that the um, enrollment rate uh, of, uh, of those who are uh, in the age, uh, you know, after high school, after graduation, they would be enrolled in the higher education system would triple uh, no one would believe you. So five years ago, if the enrollment rate was 9%, now it's 30%. So, and uh, if our high school system, um, you know, uh, graduates close to uh, 600,000 pupils every year, then imagine what 30% does these days uh, to absorb that uh, big, uh, labor potential into the labor market and the rest are either in the vocational education or private sector or going abroad so uh, that's huge that's that's huge because of the president and his uh, and his team uh, initiating this big changes in the higher education area 
uh, in Uzbekistan. If you could tell me that uh, we will have, uh, uh, Maya spoke about autonomy and some of you touched upon autonomy uh, and academic freedom. If you could tell me that 35 universities in Uzbekistan, the big ones uh, will have an academic and financial independence uh, no one would believe you, but now uh, because of the recent presidential decree in December adopted and signed by the president uh, of Uzbekistan, Shavkat Mirziyoyev, we have 35 universities across the country uh, who are financially, organizationally and academically independent. Uh, they're free to develop their own curriculum, they're free to um, uh, set the, uh, their own tuition rate, their own admission requirements, and so on. Uh, so it's it's a big bold move again, uh, and by the government of Uzbekistan to provide these experimental um, uh, freedoms for universities. Uh, and it uh, uh, here the the basic idea, the basic goal is to make sure that students receive quality education. So uh, Westminster, for example, internationally, we're just celebrating our 20th year here. So if you think of that, uh, Uzbekistan has been independent from the Soviet Union for 30 years, uh, and two thirds of the time Westminster has been here since 2002. And one of the things uh, we are sharing our best practices with local universities is, for example, the simple, how do you implement the credit system? credit module system. So, um, so we're, we're, we're sharing that practice, we're sharing our knowledge, uh, uh, what the role of registrar is, what the role of IT infrastructure is, what the role of, of digital libraries are, uh, so uh, what the role of uh, curriculum development is. And uh, those are some of the things we're doing. And, and I think the next 30 years, <laughs> Uh, I'm not sure about the story is, but next 10 years are very exciting uh, for higher education in Uzbekistan because I think we will see um, big, big improvements for, uh, for students' employability, but also for students' critical and creative thinking, their soft skills, but also knowledge production. So some of the panelists touched upon this, that uh, we have predatory journals and some of the institutes are not very keen to have uh, the good environment for critical and creative thinking um, and so on. But the credit modules, the, the, the bridge system we implement here is based upon the principle of independent learning. So we, we're very much uh, keen to promote this independent learning and which was very um, uh, fruitful and shows uh, that this this can be this experience can be replicated and can be done successfully um, and and I am very optimistic so I'm very optimistic and I hope uh, some of the in the next story uh, we uh, we have adopted the higher education concept for 2030 or until 2030 and uh, some of the things is uh, basically to make sure that some of the universities who are not who were not given the independence yet because of, you know, we have more than 35 universities will receive that based on the lessons learned from these 35 universities. So it's a gradual approach uh, to um, strategic management of university administration in the country, but also make sure that they're globally linked through different SDG impact rankings or times higher education rankings or uh, any sort of ranking you have in mind that uh, uh, so you have these uh, Uzbek universities uh, to be shown on the global map. So I'll stop here. Ron, thank you so much for this really optimistic view. It's really important because we share not only some issues and problems, but some positive views also. And let's continue our discussion. Uh, my next question will be to Maya once more. Uh, in what ways do university research outputs contribute to social development? I know that it's strongly related to the topic which you're uh, researching now and uh, a year ago. <laughs> Thank you. Um, thank you for inviting me and it was really interesting to listen to other speakers. 
Um, so we have done quite a bit of interesting work with your colleagues at HSC in the last few years. And um, I will share that publication where we overview um, uh, basically all research output that has been in the global space from former Soviet countries. It shows lots of interesting trends and shows where different countries stand in terms of the quantity of output, in terms of impact and in terms of quality. So lots of that work has been done with Andrei Lovakov. I think he was in the audience here as well. So I will not now start describing the findings from that study, but rather focus on your actual question. Uh, so how research output, how research capacity um, can contribute to societal development. So I would connect and go back to where I started at the start and say that contributions of university-based research to societal development can be seen purely in instrumentalist way in applied terms or can be seen much more broadly in critical terms, in emancipatory terms. That's where also blue skies research would fit, basic research would fit. So while applied research that is done across the countries and seems to be much more highly valued currently across all countries that we are talking about in the former Soviet space is underpinned by the idea of modernization of society. Basic or blue skies research assumes that research does not necessarily need to serve any immediate specific ends and can be an end in itself, allowing academics and students the freedom to pursue their intellectual interests. Okay, so this is a very big difference between two different types of approaches to research and the ways in which research can ultimately contribute to society, while applied research may be seen as contributing much more immediately in the short term, perhaps. Basic research, blue sky research can have a much larger term impact. The impact of this may not be visible immediately, okay? So applied research again is underpinned by human capital modernization theories, assuming that value of research is purely scientific rather than political or emancipatory or critical, okay? Applied research is all about the objective truth. So when we asked in our study with Iqbal John and Dilbar, um, academics in Kazakhstan and Georgia, how they thought their universities were contributing through research to the development of their societies, I will not now list everything that they said, but I must tell you that and the absolute majority of academics saw the contributions of university-based research to societal development purely in applied terms. So academics spoke about various research institutes, centers, groups, and projects studying, focusing on civic education, child development, ecology, biodiversity, various areas of applied physics, chemistry, uh, and how through those groups and institutes, uh, uh, they produced research that um, had some applicability, immediate applicability. Very interestingly, also through our study, we saw that academics were thinking about a few areas in which uh, they wanted to see more development so that their research could contribute better to the needs of society. So one of those areas was industry needs. So lots of academics spoke about the need to understand what is required within their respective industries and to somehow connect their research with industry needs in order to find solutions, okay? Um, so various industries, not only kind of um, uh, industries uh, where we see kind of specific heavy industries, etc., but also specific businesses um, that they worked with, as well as industries, for example, education can be industry, health can be industry. So they spoke about a variety of industries that they wanted to connect uh, more closely with. So second area they thought uh, would benefit from further development was uh, better ability, better skills to translate the findings of research into practice. 
okay? And coming up with better ideas of applied research and better scenarios for societal development. These were mainly economists, social scientists who were thinking about various scenarios of societal development and kind of trying to make things much more practical, even more applied than what they were doing, okay? Yet another area was the communication of research findings to their industries and to the wider society. So they thought it would it was a great idea, perhaps, for the universities and policymakers to think about the ways in which research findings emerging from universities and also research institutes can be better communicated to the audiences that might benefit from this research findings. And finally, they were also talking about boosting the image of science, creating the environment where research and innovation is encouraged and where science and scientists are popular. OK, now, very interestingly, neither the current experiences nor the future imaginaries of our respondents included the so-called purely blue skies research or critical or radical science for addressing the biggest development challenges that they saw in their societies. So blue skies research assumes that research does not need to serve immediate specific ends, as I mentioned earlier, and allows academics and students to pursue their intellectual interests, perhaps without a clear vision of how this translates into applicable um, output. In this regard, blue skies research can be viewed as a domain that expands to a certain extent extend freedoms of academics and students in line with human capabilities and liberation approaches that we're talking about in our article. The survey respondents final did not contain any indication that Blue Skies research as such was considered important when discussing the role of higher education in contributing to societal development. So it is somehow argued in our paper that perhaps that is one area where things can go. And lots of respondents mentioned here rankings, right? So we think about rankings. If you look at the institutions that are at the top of the rankings globally, they do a lot of blue skies research. They do a lot of research that does not immediately translate into applied output. Okay, this is very important to understand. They do a lot of research that is entirely driven by the intellectual interests of academics and students. Okay, I'll stop there. Maria, thank you so much for this really comprehensive discussion around the linkages and relation between this academic world and the applied world and so forth. It's really uh, fruitful and interesting. And uh, we should move forward from this academic world and how it can be translated to the social practice to the social practice part uh, entirely and my next question will be to Iqbal John uh, and it will be the following what are the practices if any of higher education support to the community in former Soviet countries sorry can, can you repeat your your question Evgeny sorry Yes, yes, for sure. Uh, what are the practices, if any, of higher education support to the community in former Soviet countries? Okay, great. Uh, so uh, I understand. Thank you for your uh, question. So uh, first of all, let me, you know, just contextualize. Yes. So uh, I'm, uh, yeah, I have some involvement in on my university level academic, you know, uh, coordination yet, yes, but uh, I don't have this kind of administrative, you know, the 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 perspective or policy level perspective. So I uh, I would like to share my observations, yes, uh, the, as a researcher uh, and also my observations as a, a citizen, yes, uh, regarding the expectations, yes, uh, from the universities to contribute to society and in this regard i have to say that you know the through our mentality that we already and also heritage yes soviet heritage uh, this traditional thinking the instrumentalist view of the university serving the you know the uh, the, the the system uh, needs but also this uh, you know some of the post soviet countries can also be uh, defined yes as 
Eastern yes uh, societies yes where the collective spirit uh, yeah the uh, is seen as a priority over let's say in the individual uh, aspirations yeah and uh, and when you combine this with the context of political economic cultural and higher education transformations and transition yeah and for any transition and transformation to succeed you need stability yeah so when you combine all of this the uh, expectations for the universities uh, both explicit but also implicit but uh, even implicit expectations you know in our countries can have more you know importance more impact than explicitly for example stated you know the tasks and expectations uh, there was they are quite elevated yes they are quite high yeah first of all this the uh, the university's uh, contribution to the stability of society why because our societies overall for example if we speak about central asia yes without singling, singling out any country the uh, we are quite young societies yes majority of you know the very significant substantial uh, demographic you know composition is composed of very young people yeah uh, where you also combine you know this economic uh, context of the uh, widespread unemployment etc cetera, etc cetera. yeah the, the the term we are using need yes not in education not in uh, training, etc. So, kind of universities also so were seen uh, by you know the the uh, policymakers, but also by by society as kind of contributor to the so stability of the society. Yeah, so that they provide kind of the 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 platform, you know, to, uh, to kind of to 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 you know the to keep these young people. Yeah. Uh, busy with you know the with studies uh, etc so that it contributes to the, to the stability and then the second one is this uh, the uh, support of the university to the community is by re-educating yes the the population both young and uh, older so again in the context of the transition and transformation re-educating a uh, them in new skills yes new knowledge yeah new kind of uh, new behavior new practices yes so that it contribute to this the this paradigm of development paradigm of transition yes so here the universities are kind of the the disseminators of uh, uh, new new in, 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 new new kind of uh, you know skills uh, knowledge uh, and uh, practices and then the uh, so here this kind this is very much linked to this idea of you know the universities are responsible for employment of their graduates yeah so this is especially now for example i'm in kazakhstan yes so this public narrative you know and public discussions around the uh, role of universities and right these days for example the minister of education is kind of uh, set up a working group where they are working now to you know to introduce some kind of their own national but ministry led ranking of universities or rangirovania in russian that there would be four categories of the uh, universities so just new discussions in front of them the, the, so uh, very important uh, kind of expectation from the university is this to contribute to the employment opportunities of the uh, of the uh, of the young young people yes of their graduates so this is also kind of a uh, kind of one of the main it's considered as one of the main contribution expected major contribution of university to the society but also to the state because at the end there's an overlap yes between the state and society uh, you know the goals objectives expectations and this overlap is maybe even more articulated in uh, in in our post-Soviet uh, geography, yeah. Uh, but then there is also kind of there is also an expectation from the 
international uh, no community that the global community why because then the universities they are part of the global higher education and uh, research uh, space yeah so there is also this uh, kind of uh, the the spread of for example the what maya is saying the you know the the critical thinking you know the the logic mentality of the the freedom uh, you know uh, conscious uh, citizenship, etc., and there are quite several, you know, the what we can call, uh, you know, liberal arts universities in in the in the region, the locally uh, uh, financed or sometimes the internationally, uh, you know, supported or branches of universities. So and uh, so they are sometimes they 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 are expected and they they are in fact realizing yes this kind of service to the society too by if we call it updating the mentalities you know the training new generation in in new ways of 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 uh, of thinking and then this the the last one and i stop here but it, because it's also very you know the part of this public you know the the kind of public narrative public discourse yes uh, for example in kazakhstan and in and it was i think the kind of came earlier was in russia there is this, but it comes from this old World Economic Forum, etc. All this, you know, this uh, industry 4.0 that there are many professions which will be disappearing, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So the university expectation. So what's expected from university is to train their students in uh, for the professions they, that that don't exist yet. Yeah, and uh, so it's kind of also kind of an ex increasingly it's an expectation from the universities and it's these things are explicitly stated by the policy makers that universities should train uh, their students graduates for the future professions that don't exist yet and so i stop here thank you well thank you so much for this uh, really um complex answer to this question and uh, presenting these uh, main expectations for different actors involved in this educational process around the higher education so thank you so much and uh, it's really interesting that we have not covered yet one really important topic but i uh, saw it in the chat and also we had a special question to susanna for it regarding the actual context of pandemic and how it uh, impacts the higher education because now we are all in probably uh, the same situation with this uh, remote learning and so forth and my question to Susanna will be following how did universities adjust to this COVID-19 pandemics teaching and learning uh, how has the quality of higher education been ensured Probably you can mention some best practices, uh, which you know about the about it. Thank you, Evgeny, and very nice question. And one of the uh, questions that is has a global coverage, basically, rather than uh, local for former Soviet countries, because all of the globe, the whole globe, overnight um appeared like in a, in a lockdown due to the COVID 2020 and uh, 2019 and then um everybody uh all the institutions quality assurance governance all the all the entities globally had to come up with a solution not only higher education not only the education system but globally everybody else needed to come up with a solution to this um major disruption um how did they well uh I would say that everybody says that the COVID-19 was a problem. I would say that the COVID-19 actually helped to reveal the problems in the system. And it helped, helped to reveal such problems as non-preparedness of the institutions in terms of risk management, mitigations, in terms of, um, a prev I mean, in the inclusion, I mean, also we talk about the, the systems that were um, overnight, they were, had to move online into online mode. and. Um, saying that we moved on the online mode it was just a technical issue what actually happened so in terms of teaching and learning assessment methodologies they were not ready very few institutions were ready to do so very few organizations were quality assurance bodies were, uh, were ready to move on to an online mode 
even the teachers, I mean, the, the faculty members, the students, I mean, name it, I mean, all of the majority of them. And uh, UNESCO has a very impressive figure of about 200 million being left behind in education. Um, and um, that's really a very huge, um, a huge, uh, you know, um, uh, blow on the system on education. But how did institutions respond? Actually, those ones who, um, uh, the institutions that were really um, well organized and had uh, robust systems of management, they were easy. They, it, it was much easier for them to readjust because uh, they were. Uh, I mean, the learning organizations helped them to uh, to transform and easily adjust to the needs. But majority of them still are suffering, and let's acknowledge that this is still a problem. And majority of the systems are still suffering. We don't yet have a proper assessment methodology, authentication methodology to make sure that the, the, you know, the integrity of education is ensured in this online modality. Plus to that, the, the teaching and learning methodologies, moving it onto the platform, online platform does not yet mean we are offering an online education. There are so many um, details and so many uh, minute uh, factors in, in, like that in, engaged in the learning, teaching and assessment that are still yet to be developed. And let's acknowledge that was under-researched area. For example, let's, let's clearly respond if the audience could respond to these questions. How many of you have had a study on how your students learn? I don't, I haven't come across a lot of studies globally. I mean, there are some countries which are really deep into it, but not majority of the countries do that. They don't look at how the students learn. So let's start with the research into education itself. We're talking about research in many areas, but research in education and especially research in education in post-Soviet countries is something that is a major gap. Without researching something well, we are actually, uh, this, the, the area is actually doomed to um, a failure. And this is what we're doing. Look, um, when you read uh, through the um, research coming in education as, and um, uh, from uh, post-Soviet countries, um, they are really scarce. And the quality of the research, when you read, well, does it respond to the question? No. Do we know how the, the students learn? No. Do we know how the faculty teaches? No. So we, it's the, these questions are yet out there. And if we don't have the responses to those questions, how can we readjust? And how do we expect to respond to those needs? So this is one of the major areas that COVID actually, I mean, COVID revealed a lot of problems in the systems related to the management, governance, like adjustment to the risk and to the, to, to the disruptions being able to offer new in a, in a new modality modality being able to uh, to adjust the assessment methodology so name it um also the quality assurance um, uh, practices were challenged out there but um the good thing is that um there are also uh, positive sides to it uh, due to the uh, online communication and everybody extensively moving on to online platform the opportunities of learning from each other have grown significantly if uh, prior to COVID, predominantly the learning and exchange of information was through face-to-face -face meetings and conferences now now we have a lot of online um you know opportunities out there from for learning e from each other and this is really a good um thing uh, we have to capitalize on the good things that we have learned from this too but uh, again um uh, what we have done is we just we're trying to survive to revive and go back to the normal but this normal is no longer the normal we had it's maybe we were in an abnormal situation during COVID and now we're coming back to the normal and um, going back to normal, we already have to reconsider what is it that we need to measure, what is it that what kind of mechanisms that we need to put in place. And believe me, not many quality, not many systems have revised their policies in terms of quality assurance accreditation, just look out there. I mean, it's still in the based on the former mode, just moving on to the online platform. But how about capitalizing on what is it that we need to fix? Linking the standards, li linking all the criteria or performance to the needs of the system. This is something that is yet to come, especially in the post-Soviet 
uh, area where we uh, the systems we are putting in place are hardly linked to the needs in the system. So there should be a, a good link over there, over there and the, 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 the mechanism should, should support responding to the needs. But again, going back, we, there is a major need to understand how our students learn in any mode and how does the faculty respond to this. And this is where we will find the responses to the question. I think that um, this is pretty much about this, but again, um, um, to be positive, um, uh, that was um, positive. I would say that that was a positive blow, negative positive blow on the system, just to reveal that we're not there and there are a lot of things to be done. And we have, there are a lot of particular things we have to address if we want the system to be sustainable. So moving from, um, uh, like sustainability, I mean, goals, I mean, sustainable education and sustainable quality assurance has become, should become a priority. And that has to be turned in through the policies to the everyday life. Sustainability should become one of the major, on, on, should move on top. Thank you. Susanna, thank you so much for this uh, answer uh, to this question. I strongly agree with the, with the idea that we should uh, develop the instruments, tools for the analysis of how our students learn, uh, how our teachers teach and so forth. So shall we promote the evidence-based uh, view uh, on the our learning and teaching in universities, especially during the pandemic. So now we should uh, say that we cannot uh, be uh good at the uh educational policy and support without this kind of data so we should focus on it and promote it thank you so much so colleagues we are moving forward and continue the uh, discussion of the pandemic situation and my next question is to Bahrom. uh what lessons have been learned from the pandemic in the ex-soviet space probably you can share your experience of your university Well, <laughs> what did we learn? Uh, uh, we learned that it's, it's very difficult because, uh, uh, because you know, you, you lost people in your society. So uh, that's one, that was a big cost to pay. But in terms of, as a university, I think, uh, we, 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 we learned to be agile, how we deliver classes. We learned how to uh, agile, how we support our students. We learned how to be effective to support our staff. Uh, and we learned uh, to create and maintain online community, uh, whether we stayed at home or whether we worked from uh, campus from our rooms or whether we you know found a place to uh, teach and um, deliver while there was lockdown or emergencies in the family or other healthcare uh, issues uh, related to the pandemic so i think many universities adjusted differently based on their uh, realities i would say and some universities I'm sure did better than, than others in the former Soviet space. Uh, one example is, for example, when you have a big um, group of students staying online, obviously you need uh, very good IT infrastructure. So you need very good server space, you need very good uh, webcams, you know, <laughs> computers to deliver those and, and um, that's one. And I think uh, uh, profession development of our staff. So we tried, we actually, what uh, Susanna said, we, we did a study with our students, how they were dealing with COVID uh, and how were they learning and what were the challenges. And we found was uh, most of our staff members, faculty were not ready to deliver online. And based on the feedback we received we were very quick to provide professional development support to our faculty on how to deliver classes online but we also developed and uh, adjusted our learning systems we have a 
internal local system and and we and and still when they came back to traditional mode of learning most students are still happy to be on campus uh, because they get to see their peers they get to you know chat they get to gossip i guess <laughs> it just provides more support and they uh, and they were happy to use these uh, facilities and space here to mingle and study and learn so uh, and we continue one outcome was we continue now with the blended uh, version of teaching and learning so and we continue to use um, zoom for big international workshops or seminars such as this and and we continue to collaborate online with our co-authors or even um, defenses of different dissertations or coursework. So, and we kept, uh, for example, very big lectures uh, online. Even now, we're back to traditional mode of teaching, um, and students really enjoy that. Actually, the lecture side of being online because they get to see the slides. It's very convenient for them. But when it comes to workshops and seminars, they'd rather have it in person, in class. Um, and, and it's small classrooms, smaller sizes, so it's more personal. Um, so, and we, we learned how to provide our resources online on the spot. So I think there's still lessons to learn and we still continue with our professional development of students and staff. Uh, it was challenging, but I think it taught us uh, to be agile, it taught us to uh, use IT and distance learning, blended learning, all types of digital learning um, better and more effectively. And I, I'm really proud of our staff and students here. So I stop. Thank you so much. But from colleagues, unfortunately, we have only three minutes till the end of our structure part. So I think that we can stop now and uh, move forward to Q&A session because we have many questions in the chat. And I will ask them now um, to colleagues. We have some focus questions to, to some speakers. So I will start with them. And the first question is for Susanna. So then, please, what is the driving force behind some individual institutions as change is, as taking leadership initiative in reports and monitoring achieving SDGs? Thank you very much. Very good question. And the triggers could be diverse of kind. So that diversity of triggers are actually there. And I would be talking about the global from global perspective here. Um, in uh, many cases, that would be the government directive or strategic priorities of the countries adopted that would trigger the institutions to align. Um, in uh, some cases, in, in, in majority of the cases, those could be uh, um, you know, financial triggers like funding link, links of the performance of the institutions and being listed in uh, and it performance against the SDGs. Um, linked to the financial um, rewards and financial uh, allocation, special allocation for um, institutions. It could be driven by the um, um, autonomy, and in the, uh, uh, autonomy and the independent status um, uh, of the institution, like academic freedom and their independence and their desire for prestige and um, attraction of more students and internationalization. Um, driven by the um, uh, you know desire to be internationally visible and acknowledged, those institutions would definitely uh, go for that and try to show their worth in the in the overall economy of the country in terms of performance against the SDG. Um, also, in some cases, um, very few cases, the quality assurance standards are becoming a treasure, uh, um, so, so a trigger for this. Uh, setting quality assurance standards that are promoting uh, sustainable development goals and are linking the institutional performance uh, uh, to the impact they have on the country and economic development. This is uh, something that is also starting to uh, emerge. Um, and um, a lot, a lot of um, system at, at the at the system level where the institutions are um, uh, more integrated and in, into um, um, a community of educationalists, 
the, the discussions are also being driven by the, those communities of uh, higher education providers that get together and uh, setting the, the, um, the goals for performance. For example, if we look at the Nordic um, and North European countries, um, and if you compare them uh, uh, against the, um, I mean, um, for example, UK and the US system, um, those the Nordic countries stand um, uh, for their uh, systemic performance um, because the um, difference, uh, because the um, uh, contrast between um, lower performance and the higher performance is really very small. Uh, in the US, you can have the best education system and the worst at the same time. So the contrast there is really very huge. But in the Nordic countries, when you put together all the institutions together and do the analysis uh, as per the institutional performance, then uh, the systems perform much better in Nordic countries rather than in other um, advanced systems. So um, uh, this is where this, it, at the systemic level, they, uh, they uh, contribute, they, there is a discussion, there is a dialogue on how to contribute to the, um, uh, as a system to contribute to the um, uh, so SDG um, promotion in the countries. So there are diversity of triggers there, but it all, uh, they, they are, there are a lot of factors also influencing that policy framework, the institutional strategies, the, the, the um, you know, um, uh, promotional uh, packages coming for the faculty to do, uh, to perform as per the uh, priorities and naming. And, and of course, most importantly, the funding as well. Links to the funding makes it work. The institutions are trying to really perform much better um, and uh, given the, the competitive funding that is available out there. So that's basically uh, coverage globally of how it goes. But in post former Soviet countries, um, if we concentrate on post Soviet countries, in very few countries, there is a link to funding. There are mechanisms funding um, this uh, performance. And um, that's it. At the policy level, there is a clear statement. But when it comes to implementation, very few mechanisms are in place. So further um, uh, efforts should be invested into this. Yeah. I'll stop here. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Suzanne. And the next question is uh, for Maya. It's a kind of comment. The question, uh, Maya, how would you measure the social development or the role of higher education? Your study focuses on the perspectives of academics, but I wonder how would the world of work or the communities of policymakers view the same? In the spectrum of the SDGs, did you focus on the all of the SDGs, or did you focus on the on one or another? Thank you. A very good question. Um, actually, I can share in a minute the whole issue that we did on the SDGs and higher education. Okay, that was published um, in 2021, in which we tried to gather evidence from different authors on how higher education contributes to different SDGs. Okay, so SDGs are very broad, obviously, and SDGs reflect because they are a result of um, uh, a lengthy process of communication between various stakeholders at the global level. So they reflect um, international development areas in almost all sectors. Okay, so how do we measure higher education's impact on SDGs is a very big question. For example, one way to measure it is obviously to see whether higher education in a specific national context is equitable, right? There are equity indicators in a variety of SDGs, whether admissions are equitable to universities. Another way to measure is whether, for example, higher education produces sufficient numbers of nurses or doctors or engineers or IT technicians that are required at the labor market, where the higher education actually tries to meet that market demand that exists out there. There are also SDGs about um, uh, variety of environmental issues, um, a variety of issues linked to higher education sector itself. For example, do we have enough teachers? Does our higher education sector prepare enough teachers? 
right? So they're very pragmatic areas where we can see those links. Um, I try to focus more on critical and broader theoretical areas rather than actually how we can measure specific things because how we can measure perhaps is not as important. See what I mean? We can measure lots of things and we cannot measure many things. Impact of higher education on societal development is a very difficult thing to measure. And if we try to measure it as policymakers, for instance, we will definitely come up with some specific indicators which will present only a partial picture. We can never come up with full indicators that will measure how universities contribute to societal development, but we can take different, little different portions, different aspects of it in the areas and sectors that we are most interested, depending what we are talking about. If we are policymakers, for example, if we're talking about economic development, we may be interested more in kind of labor market, how higher education meets labor market demand and where there are gaps. If we talk about equity, we may want to talk about the admissions, the specific groups that are disadvantaged, for example, women or rural students, etc., because a lot of SDGs is about equity um, uh, and so on and so forth. If we're talking about moving to kind of green economy, and there is a lot about environments um, in SDGs, uh, then we may want to focus on institutions who, that prioritize research uh, on green economy and perhaps um, have specific um, educational programs also in that area. So very broad question, there is no single answer, but I will now share a link to the special issue where there are lots of different articles, especially there is one done by colleagues at UCL that tries to bring together all evidence about the links between higher education and SDGs. It's a systematic review. So that one may be particularly useful for the person who asked this question. Thank you. All right, thank you so much. And thank you for mentioning these papers. I think it's, it is really useful for colleagues to read them uh, just after this discussion. And uh, the next question is to Bahrom. Um, you underline the importance of students soft skills development at university. Could you please possibly briefly explain how you develop the soft skills uh, uh, at your university? Probably you have some life hacks, uh, know how and how to do it. Um, <clears throat> well, one of the ways uh, we develop hard and soft skills uh because our curriculum is validated by the university of westminster in, in the uk uh, we embed them into the curriculum uh, that's one um, this this uh, could take the form of of uh, different assessments for example uh, this could take the form of um, different uh, project-based learning um, and uh, experiential learning through field trips uh, and so on. Uh, one is through curriculum and uh, what's taught in the classroom. Uh, the second is uh, we have developed a very good uh, student support, um, student support center or student support unit for our students, which, which integrates um, social support, academic support, uh, employability support, sports, um, and, and whatever happens in our residence halls, dormitories. So, and through those, uh, we devote and, and our students union. So through, through those um, different units, uh, because what you, uh, you learn soft skills by practice. Uh, so we have uh, invested and cultivated and initiated and support many student driven uh, initiatives. So through different clubs and societies, for example, or, or sports. So we have a very strong uh, sports teams in volleyball, basketball, badminton, football, you know, you name it. But also we have very strong uh, career support center, which provides a lot of the skills that's needed in the job market uh, once they graduate or during, the, during their studies. Um, and another would be academic support when they learn um, you know, soft skills such as create, uh, critical thinking, 
for example, through uh, support for their dissertation work or coursework, but also we have very good um, um, uh, units where we provide support for arts and uh, photography and um, chess and different intellectual games. You know, I think through those, uh, our students learn how to collaborate, how to compete with each other, how to respect, how to present, how to argue, how to, you know, convince other, how to, how to negotiate. So I think those are the uh, important, one of the most important skills now uh, very much uh, valued by the employers and, and by the parents too. <laughs> so, and I think this is one of the things we see that with the independence of a lot of these uh, local universities, they will be able to go from, um, you know, plant or sort of top-down approach to bottom-up competitive uh, quality education where they provide not only the hard skills, but also the soft skills uh, to make it more interesting to study and to learn and be a student. So I hope I answered. Yes, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Bahram. And uh, the next question is to Ibal John. Uh, could you please tell us a little bit about the uh, landscape of uh, journal publications? Um, how many of them uh, are published in English and how many in your language? Could you please make a brief description of it? Okay, uh, thank you for the question. Yes, here is what I can give you the, the overall, the big picture, yes, in terms of the, you know, the the language out yeah the languages uh, in which research articles are published yeah uh, so here again we have this uh, you know the 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 some kind of pa parallelism yeah uh, kind of because the usually in post soviet uh, countries yeah the research journals uh, uh mostly they were so-called the westniks yes the bulletins of the you know national universities yes so you have the universities uh, publishing uh, the bulletins yes westniki uh, which are kind of the scientific journals which are recognized by the higher station committees etc so these are usually in in russian or local languages yeah but now uh, so here again, we'll link it to the expectations uh, articulated by governments, but also by, you know, the society vis-a-vis -vis, uh, universities, university researchers, is that the universities, they should now try to uh, enter global rankings, yes, and achieve, you know, the decent uh, rankings in global rankings, yes, so it can, it can be. US Times Higher Education or Shanghai Ranking, etc., etc., where you know the bulk of yes, sometimes up to forty percent of your uh, score it comes from uh, publications, yes, from uh, scientific research output, and in this uh, system, what counts is like it's in English language publications, yes. Uh, why? Because it's international reviews, yes, international journals. Uh, most of them, you know, it, it's it's in English, and it's not only true for post-Soviet space that you have to, you know, the follow and try to publish as much as possible in English language, but it's also uh, true for France, for example, or for 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 Germany, yeah, because uh, the the being a French language research is also kind of a disadvantage. For example, if you want to have the, you know, the this kind of global, uh, you know, performance, global uh, reputation. So most of the journals, they are in English. Yeah. And when you see, when you look at the official, uh, the regulations, yes, uh, which uh, identifies the criteria criteria for uh, obtaining, for example, uh, scientific degrees, yes, PhD, yeah, for example or also for academic pro promotion yes to get uh, you know associate professorship to get full professorship yeah uh, the, the 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 biggest uh, performance indicators these are the publications in 
Scopus, yes, in a more popular manner, yeah, or Web of Science, yes, in a kind of Web of Science, and uh, especially you have also have this Q1, Q, Q2 uh, publications, which outweigh all other, you know, the performance indicators, and most of the journals which have this Q1, Q2, uh, you know, the in the Web of Science, they are in English, and so that's why we can say that, uh, you know in terms of maybe volume yeah you have the publications uh, in the journals in any language yeah but uh, the in the official criteria assessment criteria what counts most yeah maybe exclusively is the english language publication Thank you so much, Ibojan. And I think that uh, unfortunately this is the time for probably last question, but this question will be to all uh, participants of our today's discussion. Uh, and I choose the following question. Um, how could countries in Latin America, the UNESCO has its base, share their local original contextual research uh, for the former Soviet countries? What are possible uh, days of uh, cooperation core informing uh, between these two or different contexts colleagues uh please who wants to answer this question i you know that it's not so easy question <laughs> yes my <laughs> this is a really great question i think um unfortunately we see very little collaboration between these two regions do we i cannot at the moment think of um, many publications that bring these two regions together or anything like that and in fact there are lots of um, parallels lots of interesting um, uh, things that have happened in the education sector in both of these regions uh, and one of the key areas is um, the increase of choice, uh, private choice, private influence, private funding in higher education. So there is a lot happening in uh, Latin America in terms of vouchers, in terms of student loans. Um, uh, and uh, the same thing applies to the post-Soviet countries. So I think there is a lot of uh, experience that we can uh, share and learn from each other. I think the main difficulty is perhaps the language, uh, but there is the English language that <laughs> we can all use for uh, bring together our experiences, our practices and sharing knowledge. It's also kind of geographic distance, I suppose, but the pandemic has shown to us and one of the actually one of the participants asked this question right now. Pandemic has shown to us that it's actually quite easy to connect to each other across the globe. Um, and my own experience has shown to me that it's it has become uh, much simpler, much less time consuming to talk to colleagues, to meet, um, and everyone is used to now working this way. So the distance between the two regions should not be such a major problem, I think. And the experiences that we have, the latest policy developments, especially in terms of student loans, vouchers, and uh, the increase of the private sector's role is quite uh, interesting. Another interesting area on which we can work together is equity in access to higher education. Uh, for example, the experience of Brazil with its positive discrimination, uh, notorious perhaps to a certain extent, practices and experience of some other countries in Latin America can be quite interesting and useful for former Soviet countries, which largely operate very similar admissions policies, very equal, but rather inequitable. So providing equal opportunities to everyone, which translate into unequal outcomes for specific groups, for example, students from rural areas. So those areas, international, those areas, i.e. privatization, access to higher education could be great areas to start collaborations. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Yes, please, Susanna. Yeah, I, I would agree that there is a very little interaction between former Soviet countries and uh, Latin America but there are good practices also. But basically um, the lack of interaction also comes from the way the, the governments are set up. Uh, so centralized and semi-centralized systems are actually uh, pushing the higher education institutions to follow strictly the government guidelines and directives 
and um, in none of the regions um, in Latin America and the former Soviet countries, they are not considering each other as partners at the policy level. That that was that might be one of the um, obstacles to that too. But um, in terms of quality assurance and when it comes to accreditors, and uh, we see a lot of uh, expertise exchange between um, faculty members who are becoming experts in quality assurance and evaluating the system uh, performance. So there is quite an interaction over there. Um, again, um, uh, the, uh, driven by the internationalization principles, the procedures that are conducted by uh, in Guahim, which is International Network of Quality Assurance Agencies, we are keeping under the tertiary education umbrella quality assurance, the interaction is really very active when it comes to reviews of quality assurance performance at the system level. So, but uh, there are good practices out there and we should be just starting learning on how to bring those two systems together because separately, although they are in different parts of the globe, globe, globe different geographical and time coverage, time zone coverage, but there are a lot of similarities in terms of the higher education issues that they are tackling. So joining together the efforts, this is the way forward, I think. Thank you so much. Yes, Iqbal Jean, please. Yes, just one quick uh, yeah, uh, addition to this comment that we, uh, that's not actually the case, but we need more interactions between the, you know, uh, Latin America and our region. Because increasingly for Central Asia, the, uh, the relevance of the term global south yeah, is increasing. Yes, the Central Asia, yeah, for many different regions, uh, reasons, yes, institutional, historically, yeah, Central Asia was kind of put in the division of, for example, Europe yeah, and Central Asia, etc. The, the perception, the apprehension of Central Asia. Uh, but uh, when you know the, you see the Latin Americas, the also kind of they sometimes articulate themselves, identify themselves as a global South. Yeah, uh, the countries with very critical mindset and uh, the experience, yes, in criticizing, in resisting or shaping this the the systemic relationships between you know the center, periphery, yeah, etc. I think the, the Central Asia could uh, uh, learn many things, in, in fact, from Latin American, yes, South, South American scholars, uh, but also institutions, yeah, but because uh, the, uh, in terms of this, you know, the geopolitics of uh, knowledge, yeah, and this, uh, the, the, the power uh, relationships within this global higher education uh, space, uh, yeah, and also all this transformation of the, 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 the world order. Uh, Central Asia is kind of sometimes uh, face the same challenges, yeah, uh, with other regions. Uh, and so uh, we could, you know, accelerate the adjustment, adaptation, improvement, and the reforms by sometimes, you know, learning and by taking, you know, the lessons from the unusual, yeah, the, the, the unusual places. Thank you so much, uh, Iqbal Jean, and thank you so much, uh, all participants of our panel discussion. Unfortunately, we have a lack of time to ask all the questions which were mentioned in chat, but probably we will collect them and then send to our panel discussion. And I, I see in the chat the activity of the changing uh, phone numbers and contacts. I think that we will not stop our discussions just uh, right now, but we will continue them on other places, on other countries conferences and our discussions and so forth. Uh, colleagues, it was a great pleasure for me to be a moderator for this session and to make a, a little uh, contribution to this discussion. Thank you so much. I would like to applaud uh, for all the participants of this uh, um, session and uh, would like to introduce uh, Viktor Rudakov, the Senior Research Fellow and Deputy Head for the International Laboratory for Institutional Analysis of Economic Reforms at HEC University for concluding remarks. So colleagues, uh, Victor, please, the floor is yours. 
thanks, Evgeny. Uh, dear colleagues, it's a pleasure and honor for me to provide some closing remarks for this conference. And first of all, I wanted to express our joint gratitude to speakers, organizers, and participants for very interesting discussion and answering a lot of questions, which considerably rich enriched our knowledge about the region and helped us share some best practices. And although many questions were answered, I think we still have some important issues, which hopefully will be reflected and elaborated in further research. Uh, overall, I think that the conference confirmed that regions in transition are a very interesting topic uh, because we have a perfect natural experiment. Uh, we have countries which shared common institutions and common legacy, and after an institutional shock uh, as a collapse of Soviet Union, experienced 30 years of transition, which resulted in creation of different institutions. And uh, some institutions experienced rapid reforms and others were preserved as it is. And uh, as we can see from the discussion, many countries face very common problems, uh, like uh, Iqbal John mentioned, like predatory publishing and some other. And the most interesting research question, uh, although it is particularly answered today and yesterday, why countries chose different pathways? Why they preserve um, some institutions but provide reforms in other institutions? For instance, like why in Belarus we still have mandatory credit distribution system and we easily remove this in Russia? Or why in Kazakhstan there was such a rapid transition to US and UK style PhD systems and we still have problems with this in Russia, right? So why some reforms were successful and others fail? Um, and I think this post-Soviet framework provide opportunities uh, for us for collaborative studies and for learning from each other. And I also wanted to emphasize that institutional change in the post-Soviet region has been covered for the last seven years uh, by the journal, which we publish at HEC jointly with Center for International Higher Education in Boston College. And this journal is Higher Education Russia and Beyond, uh, which is intended to highlight uh, this transformation process of higher education in Russia and countries of the region. And uh, so I will probably send a link uh, to this journal in the chat so you can see it. Um, and I'm happy to announce that jointly with UNESCO, uh, Dana and Emma, as well as with uh, participants and speakers of this conference, including Maya, Susanna, and Iqbal John, and others, uh, we prepare a special issue of the journal, which is devoted to the topic of 30 years of institutional transition, including country cases and review of common problems. And this issue will be out in April. And I believe that some results of today's discussion can be found there. And not only in oral form like today, but also in a written form. And uh, hope it can be interesting for those who are uh, interested in the topic. And I also hope that in five years we might have this conference offline and probably hosted by HEC University or any other uh, place and see each other in person and discuss the developments of the next five years. And thanks again, everyone, for this fruitful discussion and especially UNESCO for the organization of this event. Victor, thank you very much. Um, colleagues, I'd like to offer four very brief, um, I don't know if you want to call them paradoxes, uh, or areas of, of contestation that I, I would like us to perhaps take forward. Um, and this sort of furthers what Victor's been uh, mentioning as well. So these four brief areas, and then two sort of general points uh, before we wrap up. For today the first victor's already discussed so i won't i won't stop on that and that's this kind of difference between convergence and divergence and victor gave some very nice examples which came up in the conference both today and yesterday about why do we see some policy reforms holding in some places but not others why do and then you know i could add to that why still you know now we are 30 years beyond this shared legacy uh, that's been so influential for higher education you know how does it hold still so strongly uh, with three decades now of experience of doing things or having the opportunity to do things differently that's the first the second i think is a bit of a distinction between um, the national and the global and that seems to me something of a, a tension which perhaps isn't unique to this space but it comes up um, I think particularly uh, yesterday, um, Maria Yudkovich gave a very interesting and, and kind of amusing um, analogy of the Olympic Games uh, to describe this. 
saying, you know, well, if you want to compete at international level, then first you have to represent, be selected to represent your country. And I thought that was quite a nice way to frame and think about this idea, particularly now that discussion was in, in the framework of rankings um, and whether, you know, universities around the former Soviet space are going to engage in that. But I think it could be extrapolated to discuss more broadly this tension between national and global and how that impacts higher education. Um, and that I think is a very live discussion, both when we think about the, the period, the 1990s in which these countries gained or regained independence, um, you know, at a, a sort of peak period for globalization through to today, and then thinking ahead to how those currents might be swirling in the future. Uh, the, the third area of tension or, um, you know, ongoing kind of, uh, discussion is, on the one hand, we have systems which are much more open, um, and I mean that open to ideas, open in terms of borders, pandemic notwithstanding, um, but there seems to be still limited cooperation despite the opportunities for openness. Uh, that was raised uh, today and yesterday, particularly in terms of research cooperation and collaboration, um, and there seems to be a lack of research collaboration, particularly within the former Soviet space, uh, but also as it came up actually, and I think here, you know, our, our sort of core audience, uh, UNESCO ESALC is in Latin America, and it came up through one of the questions today about cooperation between regions um, as well. So I think that's an interesting area for us to think about. And the fourth, I think, which is a little bit related to that is again, we have the possibility of change. We have the possibility for reforms and Victor mentioned a couple, but we also have some very strong norms which are guiding the scope of what those changes might be. And these days, I would argue that those norms are more kind of global in nature. Um, we have, so it, well, John talked today about, for example, the use of English language. Um, we've had discussions again about ranking. So how much do those norms or ideas or practices shape those possibilities for change. And then I mentioned um, just two sort of areas for, again, not so much of a, a tension, but to think about as well. The first, uh, which has been discussed, I think, very nicely today in different contexts about the impact of the pandemic. Uh, that was also discussed yesterday in, in relation to, for example, the academic profession. Um, how much does this reveal, as Susanna mentioned today, what's already been kind of there in the background, how much does this change how we think about and how we plan for the next three decades, um, taking that time frame. And just as one final point, I think what uh, we've seen from being able to bring people together over the past two days is that there's a real need for this kind of platform um, to discuss these kind of issues, to be able to reflect both at my macro and meso level about the last 30 years and what might lie ahead and to be able to think about all of that in different perspectives as well. So I think that's a very nice way to end because it allows me to thank uh, very warmly all of our speakers today for such excellent contributions and to remind to thank all of our participants for their you know, deep and good engagement um, and to remind colleagues that the recordings for today's session and yesterday's session will be posted onto our uh, YouTube channel and my colleague has given the link in the chat. And also, as Victor mentioned, just to say again, to look out for the, um, the forthcoming issue of higher education in Russia and beyond. So I'm going to ask for our panelists to come back into the screen so that we could take a, a final photo. And as we do that, we will thank once again, everybody uh, who's made this conference a great success. Um, I'd like in particular to thank Daria Platonova at HSC University in Russia. I hope that she can come back in, uh, can be brought into the spotlight so that you can um, all see her. And um, Dan Abdrashova, my colleague at UNESCO ESALC, who's been a real driving force behind this conference. So I want in particular to thank her for her contributions and her work. So uh, we'll do a small countdown and take a photo. Um, and I'm just, so I'll just pause for that. So um, Edward, if you're ready, we could do three, two, one. And hopefully you've it's managed done. to take it. Yeah. It's done. Perfect. <laughs> Super. OK, again, everybody, thank you so much. Um, and we're now going to wrap up and end the recording. So thank you again for joining us. And we hope to see you again um, at HSC University or at UNESCO ESL very soon. Thank you and goodbye. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. And see you soon. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, thank you to everyone.